The Utopian Seed Project presents Southeast Seed. Huge thanks to this episode's presenting sponsor, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. There were just so many. There were purple ones, there were green ones, there were shiny ones, there were curly ones, there were tall ones, there were short ones. I'm talking. Today, we're going to talk about collards. And these in particular are a nice savoy. Uh, the Latin name for collard greens is Brassica oleracea, but that species category isn't as helpful as you might think because it applies to many other vegetables besides collards. Do collards and cabbage interbreed? Yes, they do as well as with cauliflower and broccoli. You know, the broccoli, the Brussels sprout, the cauliflower, those are in uh, the scale of time, recent introductions, all of them are only known in any amount in the last couple hundred years. It's funny, they come from a European vegetable, but they were definitely selected and developed in the southeastern United States. Before they came there, they just didn't ever have any group of people who really liked them. Brassica oleracea was domesticated around the Mediterranean thousands of years ago and bred into a variety of forms, like broccoli and cauliflower, but it's only when the lineage came to the southeast that it became collard greens. The enslaved African people really wanted dark green, leafy greens, and the English had been selecting everything to not be like that. Uh -huh. So that's one of the special reasons that collards took over. And those uh, enslaved cooks uh, spiced it up and got the white people to eat some greens. By Africans who were enslaved, they were trying to keep culture, they were trying to think about survival, thinking about, you know, children yet to come. They were thinking about a lot of things. So collards were first developed as their own distinct variety of brassica by people enslaved in the southeast in the 1700s. Since then, this American lineage has diversified into an astonishing variety of dark leafy greens. Let's take a look at a collard trial where multiple varieties of collards are grown right next to each other to compare their traits. Here we are in the trial garden. We get a chance to see how our different collards had fared with the winter weather. As you can see, if we walk down, we've still got really good coverage from the collards. There's definitely gaps where they died throughout the winter, so effectively what we're seeing here is the winter survivors. It gives you a quick visual of uh, their hardiness, how big they have maintained, which ones, uh, you know, got tip damage, that sort of thing. It also really lets you see how uh, recent the differentiation and Brassica oleracea is. You can see ones that remind you of a Brussels sprouts in their growth pattern. Others that uh, you can see how broccoli was recently in the last, you know, 150 years selected uh, out of this gene pool. These are mixed gene pools because, uh, for example, there's one that looks really much like a, a kale. With so many collard varieties flowering, then seed saving pure varieties would be quite challenging because you can see these beautiful yellow flowers and they're perfect flowers. So they have um, stigma and stamen for self-pollination, but they are not self-fertile. So they are obligate outcrosses. They require pollen from a different genetics. So flowers not of the same plant to cross-pollinate them. If you have a field like this, full of different varieties, then there is an extremely high chance of cross-pollination between the varieties, because insects are required to carry pollen. Normally, seed savers will try to keep varieties of plants from the same species far away from each other to keep their genetics isolated, but sometimes it can be quite useful to understand how different varieties will perform under the same conditions, so breeders will do a trial. Trials can help you decide which varieties for your particular location uh, you want to save seeds for. You don't know which ones are going to do best, uh, you know, in a certain soil type, a certain climatic area. So having all of these, uh, generally speaking, will give the farmer who's seed saving 
a big pool to save seeds from. Trials are valuable because they can give a grower a sense of just what's possible for a particular crop. The way that different plants grow can suggest potential crosses and just give a better idea of what makes a collard green a collard. And when you do a trial like this, what information are you looking to gain? It's good to start out with some goals ahead of time if you can, but often that's often they shift and change as you go. I would just look for the ones that look really nice. Bolting, frost damage, just sort of like size and vigor. Trials are essential because this is how we know, this is how we can say things about varieties. We can be like, this variety is especially cold tolerant or especially slow to bolt. And if you don't, if you're not comparing it to other varieties in sort of a direct way, it's harder to be able to say that. It's really nice to be able to see them all together and figure out what you could say about the varieties and maybe figure out which ones you want to prioritize. Like sometimes it's good to not be, to really not do a lot of selection the first time you grow a crop because mm -hmm. you don't you're not really sure what you're looking for mm -hmm. uh, and then you kind of get to know it you do a little bit of roguing and a little bit of selection but you don't really change it a lot and then the next year you know what you're going for. So doing a trial can help you get to know your crops, help you understand the scope of diversity that exists. And this is more important now than ever as the diversity of our colored varieties continues to shrink. There has been a massive loss of the genetic diversity. You can go and find uh, like scanned copies and that kind of stuff of seed catalogs from the 1910s, the 1920s, and the diversity and amount of varieties that are there is mind-blowing and 90% of them you're not going to find because big agriculture came into the world. Companies like uh, Semenis went around on a buying street and uh, these older uh, family-owned seed companies, they just bought them up, bought them up and uh, made and took the genetics and put it into their gene bank, but made less and less of these varieties available for sale direct to consumers. That kind of thinking and mindset ruined the genetic diversity that used to be around. And it's so sad because, I mean, you just long after those varieties that you see in those old catalogs and they're so beautiful. When you look at the charts of like what was available in the seed catalogs and, um, you know, um, 1900 versus 1980. They were super thick. You know, they were they were these. They were like a compendium of every seed in the world. You know. You know, there was something like 87 varieties of radish in the, in the 1900s, and now there's 12. Starting after the Second World War, our agriculture department had a policy that was kind of like get big or get out of agriculture. So if you're a small farmer and you wanted to preserve some of the remaining diversity in our collard varieties, how would you do it? Collards are biennials. That's one thing you need to know. They need to have had at least about 50 days of uh, temperatures that are below 50 degrees, usually below 40. Uh, in order to decide they're grown up enough to make seeds. So in general, in the southeast where we live, people will start them in late summer or early fall. I mean, you can grow, start them in the spring, but if you start them in the spring, you put yourself into a whole heck of a lot of trouble with a lot of bugs. If you start them in late summer and carry and grow them in the fall and winter mostly, and then when it starts warming up in the spring, the plants, instead of being these old dudes like this, start growing really fast, getting big, and then putting up a big old tall flowering stalk. So with your collards, you need to have that, have them have warm, and then a cold period, and then warmth again. And they need an extended period of that, like I said, at least 50 days uh, of uh, temperatures below 50 degrees before they will start flowering. The trickiest part of saving collards is accommodating for their cold requirements in order to get them to bolt. In the south, this usually means leaving them in the field from the fall through the winter into late spring, almost an entire year of taking up bed space. So this can be tricky to incorporate into your crop plan. But if you do, the process of saving the seed itself is pretty easy. They come up and 
start flowering in the spring. I wanted to yeah. show this kind of from beginning to end. So after a collard has sort of done its thing, it sends up a big old seed head and it's starting to get a little wilty now, but this is it in its very first form of making seeds. This is it blooming and doing its flowers. And then after it blooms, you can see that each blossom becomes this little, looks like a little tail of a seed pod. When the flowers are fertilized, they make little skinny pods. They call them siliques. So in here, we're gonna get some seeds. And here's some bigger seed pods, look so. Yeah. And you can see each little bump is gonna be a seed in there. So there are literally hundreds of seed that would have been on this one branch right here. And you can uh, harvest them all at once or you can harvest the ones that were set earlier first and then leave uh, the later set ones to continue maturing more. As they progress, this is middle stage whenever it has swollen more and you can see how it's developing and making seeds in there. I strip all of the leaves off of any of the brassicas when they get to this point. They just seem to perform better and instead of sending any life force to any of those leaves, they're sending all of those pods. And we can probably get one of the fatter ones here. And I like to eat them before they get too tough. I, they are delicious like that. And there we are. So there are green, mm -hmm. little immature. And they dry up brown or black? They, they dry up mostly black, brownish looking. They're, they're almost there in here. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of the midway point. And then after the midway point, when they're fully dry, you will come along and they kind of rattle a little bit. I can hear that. I don't know if the camera can hear it, but I can hear it. But they rattle a little bit, and then you can take a pod off, and it splits open pretty darn easy. Huh. And there are the seeds. Because you want them really dry and crisp uh, to get the seeds out and have the seeds be uh, fully mature. Sometimes people just sort of pick a time in between when about half of the seed pods seem like they're fully uh, developed and are starting to dry out and if the weather is like threatening to rain or something like that they'll bring them in and let them finish drying under cover. And the reason that you generally want to put a tarp or something solid underneath is because uh, as, as the pods completely dry they will shatter and the seeds will fall out of them if you don't get around to taking them out. After your collard seed pods have been harvested and dried, the next step is to process and clean the seeds. There are many methods for removing unwanted plant material from your seed stock. Some are pretty sophisticated and others are hilariously simple. This is a small scale method. You can use a pillowcase. You come across your plant, you say, I want to plant, I want to seeds. And then you just take it and you start shoving it into your sack. You just shove them all in. You're like, okay, well, I don't want all of this plant material. I just want the seeds. How will I make sure that I only have the seeds? There are certain times in life, especially with gardening, that you get to take your aggressions out on some things. I've got a really, really old baseball bat and some real old sheets, and I just get it all in the sheet and tie it up and then go Babe Ruth on, uh, on that sheet. <coughs> and stamp on them. <laughs> <laughs> you do a little bit of that. That's why the pillowcase is very important. Make sure the pillowcase has no holes in it or your seeds will escape. Whacking them places. And really, we're just trying to break apart those dry parts and release as many seeds as possible. And beat the heck out of them and it ends up Perfect. It is just, <laughs> you you have nothing but crushed holes and beautiful seeds in the bottle. So yeah, with dry seed saving, 
you need to do some smashing. Give them an opportunity to break apart. <laughs> that's my favorite thing to do. I, that's not my one little act of aggression and violence in the garden in here. That's the, that's the only only one you get. Any any uh, plant that has it done right uh, in, in the whole year, you can be like, that's for you too. You can take your sheet and lay it out in an area and you can play some music and you can have your friends all stomp on the sheet at once. Mm -hmm. Yes, also very good. Yeah, that, that's the that's the one little bit of fun you get. But yeah, that that is a good way to do it. Just beating it uh, in a sheet or even stomping on it, like mm -hmm. you said, anything. That's usually how I work with any of that. So once you've taken out your aggression on your seed pods using whatever brute force method appeals to you most, you're left with a mixture of seeds and chaff, stuff that isn't seeds. And the next step is to separate them. Once you've threshed the items, you have a mixture of seeds and chaff. Um, and chaff is just like anything that's mixed in with your seeds that is not seeds and that you don't like as much. You're working on two different principles while you're dealing with seeds. One is that you're going to separate things by weight, and the other principle involves separating things by size. I bet that if we rub this, yes, more seeds will fall. We can see the seeds. Let's see. Let's move. Mm -hmm. Most of it. don't want to move. Oh, oh wow! wow. <laughs> None of the big pods can fit through the holes, all the little seeds drop in. Those are all small scale examples of using screens to filter seeds from chaff, but the same principles apply at even larger scales. You seeing stuff falling out or? Yeah. Often, filtering by size is insufficient to produce solidly clean seed, so additionally, the seed needs to be winnowed. So winnowing is a process where you separate things by weight. And this is where the Noble Box fan comes in handy. If I have the seeds and I have the chaff and I drop it in front of this fan, the chaff is going to go away while the seeds, which are heavier, are going to fall down. Winnowing can also happen at many scales. At its simplest, it can consist of just passing seed through the path of a box fan. More sophisticated methods use enclosures to control the flow and pressure of air to filter out specific weights of seed. Here's a machine that I built. It was an open source design online. And it's another form of uh, winnowing out. So now we got rid of like a majority of the, the volume of the seeds and we should be left with really light chaff and with hopefully a lot of seeds. The seeds fall down here, and because they've got this kind of staircase, they fall down relatively slowly. The shock back creates a pressure in here by sucking the air this way. And so anything lighter, which is unviable seeds, which don't have a fully developed embryo, tend to be lighter. And all the detritus, chaff, etc., gets pulled through this channel. The pressure drops here, and all the chaff drops down there, the good seeds drop down there and the air is pulled out into the shop vac. Me and my five-year-old daughter built this in an afternoon with parts we found in our shed from these designs. Pretty much super clean seeds. At even larger scales, farmers will use engineered devices and there are even some industrial scale machines that are open source, like the Winnow Wizard. This machine allows you to customize the pressure of the air and the distance of the seed fall path to select for a highly specific seed weight. And that is collars. That is an heirloom collar uh, that has been grown in my county since the about mid 1800. So that's how you save collard seed. There is significant labor in storing and drying and crushing and screening and winnowing the collard seeds, but that labor does not need to conflict with growing collard leaves for market. While you do have to plan for them to take up extra bed space for longer, the economic reasons for having combined seed and market operations are compelling. There's this big thing between market gardeners and seed growers or seed farmers. What is the big thing? The big thing is that one thinks that they can't do the other. So a market gardener such as myself is like, well, you know, there's all these isolation distances, there's all the, the processing and that kind of stuff and I don't have time for that. I'm trying to sell produce and, you know, make my money and I, I don't have time for that. And then the seed farmer, 
way is like, well, you know, I've got to, I can't worry about selling stuff. I've got to focus on um, the saving the seeds and the isolation distances and all of this. And I don't have time to sell the fresh product. And mm -hmm. both can work beautifully together because it does for me. I am a market gardener that um, also grows three to five varieties of seeds for seed companies every year. In the high value sales time like in November and December you could do a light uh, harvest when the price is twice as much as it is at other times a year and make a little money and still have uh, plants that are large enough to go through the winter and make a, a seed crop for you the next year. As a market gardener, I grow a lot of brassicas, Brussels sprouts, collards, cabbage, all of that. But whenever it comes seed time, I've already harvested everything else that's mm -hmm. out there. Only so let one species on, go to flower. Only let one species go to flower. So it takes a little bit more thinking and mm -hmm. a, a bit more planning than you would normally have to do. but it's worth it it's really worth it and also i think as a market gardener it is really important and beautiful to see the crops come to that full maturity and you get to see the entire transformation from seedling to back to that again i want to experience that entire transformation and get to see that beauty from beginning to end and then start over again. To save seeds is to care for crops from their tiniest embryonic beginnings, not just until the leaves are mature or the fruits, but past the end of a single life cycle and on into the next generation. This is more complex work than harvesting just collard leaves, but it's worth it. In a way they're easy, mm -hmm. it's just that the timing is a little different than other things. The only downside, honestly, is just the longevity of them taking up the space a little bit longer. To watch that grow to fruition and save the seeds and all of the beautiful things that come with that, that that's, that's all I need. Collard greens are a true crop of the southeast. This is where they were developed and their history is tied to the region. Over the last century we've lost many varieties but that just makes the ones we have still all the more valuable. Most of the time when farmers grow collards those plants are evolutionary dead ends. They never get to make flowers or seeds for the next generation but sometimes with the help of a seed saver the lineage continues on. It's important work. Worth doing. Big thanks to our video series sponsors and thanks to our media sponsors. This project was funded by Southern SARE.